Hey, this is John. Let's Talk Native is now on Patreon. You can support the show by going to patreon.com slash let's talk native. We will be producing exclusive content for our Patreon supporters. Thanks for checking us out. Let's Talk Native is produced at the LTN Studios on the Cataraugus territory of the Seneca Nation. We break all the rules for Native media by peeling back the layers of assimilation and indoctrination. No prayers, no buffalo speeches, and no spirituality shows. While this podcast does not provide a path to spiritual enlightenment, we do take a tough look at history, oppression, and our survival. We highlight the voices of Native activists, writers, poets, artists, thinkers, and musicians who are fighting for the rights of Indigenous people all over Turtle Island. We may step on a few toes through our examination of culture, art, politics, history, and identity. But the real goal here is to bring our people together by breaking down what separates us. In this moment of historical change and social justice, our voices matter now more than ever before. So, welcome to Let's Talk Native with John Kane. All right. Hey, thanks for joining us here. Uh, I'm going to talk about a, a topic I've brought up before. But you know what I do? Every once in a while, I'll get a memory that will show up on Facebook that... Uh, I think is something that is worth recycling, whether it's, you know, a Jack Ahostin cartoon or whether it's a meme that I've posted or that I've grabbed from someplace before. Um, but I, I reposted a comment that I made about federal recognition. And, and, I, and I'll read just a part of it. It's just to clarify an issue related to the federal recognition of a tribe, band, or nation of Indians. The U.S. federal government, through its Department of the Interior list, 573, I think it's up, It's more than that now, but this is from a year ago, uh, federally recognized tribes. They define a federally recognized tribe as a tribe, band, or nation of Indians subordinate to the laws of the United States and under U.S. jurisdiction. Now, and, and, and the comment goes on, and, and it did get a pretty good uh, reaction. A lot of people, perhaps they didn't see it when I posted it the first time, uh, new people on the, on the page or whatever else. But I also know that's just Facebook, and I want to reach out to more than just the, the, the people who, who read these kinds of things on Facebook. I wanted to have more of a conversation. So, again, to reiterate, federal recognition defined by the federal government is a tribe, band, or nation of Indians subordinate to the laws of the United States. Now, on a couple of other conversations that I've had over the last week or so, I've heard people say things that just makes me shake my head, like federal recognition is about recognizing our sovereignty. No, it's not. And, and look, for my friends in Hawaii who are really facing a, a push for them to give up on their um, on asserting the Hawaiian kingdom and agreeing to become a tribe, uh, a federally recognized tribe of the United States, they know what I'm talking about. Fed Rec, as, as I use the expression, and I don't mean R-E-C, but I call it W-R-E-C-K. Um, this is, you know, it's, it's kind of my, my coin phrase. <laughs> um, it, it is really a destructive, um, it, it's a ruse. The, the whole idea of suggesting to somebody, oh yeah, we're, we, we want to federally recognize you as this, that, or whatever it all goes away when you realize that this is about domesticating any attempt to assert autonomy. You know, I've gone through the, the five uh, policies of the United States, you know, and, and assimilation is one that is pervasive through all of it. But even their so-called self-determination policy is, is confined to this notion of internal self-determination. And look, their uh, National Security Council went so far as to say these kinds of things. They, that, that they reject the international definition 
of um, self-determination, which sounds a lot like statehood. And, and I don't mean U.S. statehood, but nation statehood. And when they talk about self-determination as it relates to us, as it relates to Native people, is internal self-determination. And they reject the notion that we have the right or authority to assert sovereign jurisdiction over our territories. And, and they say it. I mean, this isn't, this isn't masked in some sort of, you know, implication. It's not implied. It is, it, it is explicitly expressed by the, uh, by the federal government. And, and it's expressed by both Democrats and Republicans. So anybody who thinks, oh, yeah, that's, you know, that's what the GOP says. No, that's, it's, it, that's exactly what the, the, the DNC says as well. So, uh, you know, again, when, when I talk about federal recognition, I, in, in the post that I put, I want to be clear, of the, of the 570 plus um, quote unquote federally recognized tribes, bands or nations of Indians, um, almost none of them, uh, the overwhelming majority of them never asked to be defined as subordinate to the laws of the United States. The, the overwhelming majority never consented to this notion of being subordinate to the laws of the United States. And only those that have applied for federal acknowledgement or federal recognition only those kind of go through that process, jump through that hoop to assert that. Or <laughs> the, the other ones that do are those that who are trying to um, reclaim lost land through the feed a trust application. You know, the, the Mashpee Wampanoag come to mind. They were actually, they actually acquired land, got it designated as quote unquote Indian country, but on the Fed rec, or on, on the um, uh, the uh, what, what are they called the uh, uh, the trust uh, uh, held in trust by the federal government for them, not actually titled to them, not under their original Mashpee Wampanoag um, title, but as lands held by the federal government for their use and enjoyment. That's that's what the the um, fee to trust application process is all about. But they got that overturned because. The Trump administration suggested that the Mashpee had not adequately proved that they were under U U.S. jurisdiction in 1934. And I'll get into the dates and wh what, the, what they all mean. But they, they argued that you cannot, and, and this, is, this is part of that fee to trust application, you cannot reacquire lost land through that process unless the federal government determines that you are under their jurisdiction and that you not only are under their jurisdiction now, but that you were under their jurisdiction in 1934. Let me, let me go back. Look, we clearly, um, just by virtue of, of, of the United States doing certain things like treaties, um, were recognized as distinct, re recognized as sovereigns, even, in spite of the doctrine of Christian discovery and this notion that that they felt like they were sovereigns in the in the in the God sense of the word, the, the idea that God gave them certain authority—that's what where the kind of the word comes from. Um, but even as there were this this doctrine of Christian discovery was was having its effect on land title issues, some places as Haudenosaunee, even in the Canandaigua Treaty, which I'm not a fan of. The United States says, we recognize, we acknowledge that the land is yours. And the United States will never claim the same. So look, they, they didn't say, we acknowledge that the land, that your land is um, for you to use. That's not what they said. They said, we acknowledge that the land is yours. And that the United States will never claim the same. Nor interfere with your, your free use and enjoyment of that land. Or your friends and neighbors, for that matter. So it is clear that the United States in dealing with maybe perhaps not all native peoples, but certainly enough native peoples to, to, to really confirm that they did acknowledge that we had um, uh, possession of, of lands, that we had the right and authority to, uh, to assert sovereignty on those lands uh, and, and to uh, be autonomous and separate from them. I mean, in the in the U.S. Constitution, Native people, Indians, as they defined us there, are mentioned three times in the U.S. Constitution. One is in the Apportionment Act of the U.S. Constitution, where it, it 
it talks about this is where the whole three fifths of a man thing come in for uh, for slaves. Uh, but they acknowledge that we are not represented by them. The, uh, so when they're talking about the apportionment of congressional representation, they say including all persons, you know, um, basically white people, all, 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 uh, all citizens, I guess. But and three fifths of all slaves and excluding Indians not taxed. That's the words that they used. So they acknowledged that we weren't a part of them and that their constitution didn't apply to us. Their, their apportionment didn't apply to us. Also in that apportionment was the right to tax and, and, and that kind of thing. So it was clear that we were not within their U.S. constitution, that we weren't covered. We were, we were looked at as essentially as, as a foreign people. On our, on our lands, but uh, but a foreign people. Now we're also mentioned in the uh, in the um, uh, the Commerce Clause, which authorizes which which defines the limitations and the powers of Congress. And it says Congress shall have the power to regulate commerce in and amongst several states with foreign nations and Indian tribes. With not of it didn't say that they have the right to regulate our commerce. Commerce it says they had the right to regulate commerce with us, so it could regulate their people as they engaged with us in commerce. They couldn't re regulate us, they could regulate them. That's what the Commerce Clause says. And then the other place that it's mentioned is in the uh, executive powers and uh, de describing the president having the authority to negotiate treaties with us. And of course, those treaties would be you know, confirmed uh, 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 by, by the Senate. But um, So those are the three places. So in all three instances, we are acknowledged and we are recognized as somebody outside of their jurisdiction, outside of their governmental control. We are, we are looked at separately. Now, that's when the U.S. Constitution was written. In um, 1864, you know, whatever, whatever it was when they, when they passed the 14th Amendment, and this was their uh, uh, attempt to solve the slavery issue and, and to count former slaves uh, or the former enslaved, I should say, as U.S. citizens. And that piece of legislation excludes us. It, it talks about um, that all people under U.S. jurisdiction are, are, are considered uh, U.S. citizens. Now, that clearly didn't involve us. I mean, and that's, you know, that's in the 1860s. So that that's the 14th amendment of the constitution. So in 18, you know, again, 14th amendment of the constitution still doesn't include us. Now, by the time they get into the, into, into the, the 20th century, there is, um, some attempt to resolve really the, the jurisdictional issue, the, the whole relationship, this, this whole awkwardness associated with there being a people living within their what they're considering their continental boundaries i guess their 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 national boundaries that are not a part of them so in in what was established not only as state commissions but as federal uh, indian commissions there was an attempt to, to figure out well how do we solve this thing you know uh, look there, there are treaty obligations there are payments that have to be made uh can we just can can't we just pretend that they don't exist so the federal indian commission in, in, in meeting with the New York State Indian Commission, suggested in the 1920s, why don't we just make them all citizens? And Edward Everett, who was the, the chairman of the, of the State Indian Commission, said, you, well, you can't do that. You can't just declare a people U.S. citizens that predate our existence. I mean, he, he made a compelling argument how absurd that proposition was. Well, that <laughs> his, uh, his opinion kind of fell flat. In 1924, they passed the, uh, the Indian Citizenship Act, where the, the, the Congress, the House and the Senate declare, and this was almost unanimous, by the way, that they declared that all Indians living within the, the continental United States are hereby declared um, to be uh, non-Indian non citizens, I'm sorry, that is, are, are hereby declared to be citizens of the United States. And th and then there's a proviso. It says, provided that nothing in this act shall you know uh, interfere with their 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 tribal you know possessions, their their rights, and that kind of stuff. But but this was an attempt in 1924 to simply just say, okay, um, you're you're now all U.S. citizens. But that that didn't work either, and it didn't work because, frankly, at that time it was already being 
worked out internationally that this idea of stripping away somebody's national character, their cultural character, and imposing another nation's character upon them, national or otherwise, was considered a war crime. I mean, it, was, it was considered illegal, a, a war crime. They called it denationalization. Later, it would be um, incorporated in a new, newly coined word called genocide to say this idea of stripping away and, and causing a people to cease to exist as, as the people they once were is, again, it is a, it's a punishable crime. And this was determined by, even before the United Nations, this was all, already part of the, uh, the international conversation. <clears throat> so the, the fact of the matter is, Many of us never <clears throat> subscribed to this notion of, of uh, U.S. citizenship. Now, that's not to say that many didn't. I mean, or uh, many didn't uh, apply or, or or work towards towards getting U.S. citizenship. I think part of the enlistment rate associated with military. I think there were certain Native peoples who, through their service in, especially in World War One, uh, uh, were granted U.S. citizenship. Uh, there were other negotiations that that would you know grant certain uh you know u.s citizenship amongst um uh you know to uh to native peoples but there was nothing that there was no effort to assess the will of all native people you know in, in the way that this this broad-based unilateral declaration would be there was there was nothing that ever suggested that we consented to this, and 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 again, I got to remind people that even in the Declaration of Independence, that that one of these foundational documents of the United States, they refer to governmental authority, and they say governmental authority is derived from the consent of the governed. Well, if we didn't consent to it, if we didn't ask for to be U.S. citizens on a broad based way, and I'm not saying individuals, I just mean. All, broadly, Native people weren't clamoring, you know, in the streets to be, you know, to, to give up their uh, national identity and adopt uh, the identity of their oppressors. Didn't happen. Didn't happen in 1924. So in, in a decade later, 1934, in a, in a further attempt to force assimilation, the United States passed the Indian Reorganization Act. Now, this was an attempt to first and foremost, do away with quote unquote traditional government. It was, it was the idea that they're going to help tribes re um, uh, define their, uh, their governmental authority, their, their, their structure, you know, their, their governance in general. And they would help tribes rewrite, you know, establish written constitutions, you know, delegation of, uh, you know, of, of authorities, you know, whether it's, you know, a legislative, executive and judicial branches of, of government, they were, they were literally going to help them craft new um, constitutions. Now, many native territories rejected the Indian Reorganization Act, but that was just that, that part of it, the idea of redefining and having the federal government acknowledge their newly established forms of government. And this is, although many did subscribe to it, I guess. And, and of course, in other ways, the federal government, state governments included, uh, were, were trying to affect where the, the authority of native peoples would be um, vested, you know, and what, rather than it be the people, whether it be a figurehead, a chief, a council, whatever, uh, elected councils. And this was a big attempt to, to change who we are. The other thing that came out of the Indian Reorganization Act was that definition I, I cited at the beginning of the, of the program. This notion that the federal government would define federally recognized tribes, would, would essentially define native people as tribe tribes, bands, or nation of Indians subordinate to their laws, subordinate to the U.S. Constitution. Now, we aren't at the table for any of these negotiations. We aren't consenting to this either. And to, I mean, to, to prove that that, doesn't, that that didn't solve the problem is when we get to today and, and experience what the, what the Mashpee Wapanaw went through. Because what the federal government is saying is that if, in 1934, when they established this definition of, of a tribe, if you couldn't demonstrate that you were under U.S. jurisdiction, 
then we got to question whether you were, whether we have to acknowledge you as a, as a tribe at all or as a native peoples at all. And limiting the ability for native people to reacquire lost lands. So this is where federal recognition is born out of this 1934 um, act, this, uh, this Indian Reorganization Act. There's a whole process that is lengthy. It's expensive. There are not just hoops to jump through, but there, there, the way you have to um, qualify to be federally recognized, if you aren't already federally recognized, is that you have to you know, express and demonstrate and prove complete and, and total submission to the United States, uh, to, to their authority. Now, that's not to say that the United States doesn't give a little bit of um, recognition to distinction in terms of membership, not citizenship, but membership. That's, and, and I, it is just so important that people realize this, that this whole process is not about recognizing us as distinct, autonomous, sovereign people. It is, it is the exact opposite of it. And, and this is, you know, it couldn't be more demonstrated or demonstrated more clearly than in what, what's happening in Hawaii. In Hawaii, there is, it is really clear that the Hawaiian people uh, have a solid argument against the United States for the illegal occupation, for the illegal um, overthrow of the Hawaiian kingdom the, and their system of governance, which included a king or a queen. In the, in the case um, of the actual overthrow, it was a queen at the time. They can show the fraud that was committed by the United States. In fact, the United States apologized for it during the Clinton administration, 1993. They actually, Clinton actually signed what they call a, a joint resolution, which is where the House and the Senate um, it's not a, a law, but they, they do some sort of acknowledgement. They, they, they have these joint resolutions of Congress. And this one's considered the, the apology resolution. And Bill Clinton signs this. Now, this joint resolution of Congress, which is a full acknowledgement about the crimes, you know, basically apologizing for the role the United States played in the overthrow of the Hawaiian kingdom, including the occupation of the Hawaiian kingdom with U.S. military, in, in spite of this, this clear acknowledgement, the Supreme Court, subsequent to this apology resolution, said, well, that has no force of law. You can't use a joint resolution of Congress to, um, uh, to make an argument about you know, land title, you know, this Ill illegal occupation. It is kind of a formality. It's kind of like when they, I mean, here's what a joint resolution of Congress does. It establishes holidays. It'll, it establishes the new name of a federal building and, and, and crap like that. It is really just window dressing. The irony of, of all this is the actual process that the United States employed to annex, and I use that word in quote, air quotes, right? Annex the Hawaii was a joint resolution of Congress. They didn't use the constitutionally laid out process that would include a, a, a foreign government requesting annexation and entering into an annexation treaty w between the United States and this foreign government. And then the, uh, the president approving that treaty and then submitting it to the Senate where two thirds of the Senate have to approve that treaty. That's not what, t what took place because a joint resolution of Congress only requires a simple majority of the house and a simple majority of the Senate. So it was a watered down process, a process that has no force of law, at least as far as the Supreme U S Supreme court is concerned. This is an example of just the absolute fraud that was committed against the Hawaiians. And so the United States today is in this precarious situation trying to figure out, well, how do we deal with, um, not just with, with Hawaii and, and the Kanaka Maoli, the traditional Hawaiians, the Hawaiian people, but how, how do we deal with, with any of this stuff as it relates to the United States claiming uh, jurisdiction over peoples and lands of, uh, that, that predate their existence? I mean, it's, it's problematic. And that's why when during the Obama administration, there was a real effort. And of course, it even predates him. But, but certainly Obama, who has, you know, he, he was born in Hawaii, I guess. And so 
he was went out of his way to push what was going to be a streamlined process. And again, remember, I mentioned earlier, this idea of getting federal recognition is a long, I'm talking about a decades long process for most to go through millions of dollars it costs. But he, in this situation, Obama, the Obama administration was trying to pass a new rule that would establish a streamlined process specifically for, for Hawaiian people to be granted uh, and go through a process to be granted federal recognition as a tribe, band, or nation of Indians of the United States. And what was kind of loaded in that was that they would not be recognized as one large group because that would be like a half a million people which would be almost twice the size of uh, you know, the, uh, the, the Navajo people. Um, this was probably going to be the start of breaking up all of the uh, groups within Hawaii by island or perhaps by, by some other designation, try to create a whole bunch of little Hawaiian tribes. And the Hawaiian people were pretty smart to it. And, and they, they rejected it. In fact, they did a whole series of meetings. Sally Jewell, who was the uh, you know interior director, even attended some of these. And you know what these guys said? Don't send the interior department. You send the, uh, send the secretary of state. This is a, a nation-to-nation conversation. We aren't Smokey the Bear. We aren't a, a park. We aren't a holiday. You, you send, the, you send the, the, the proper people here. So it, it did not go well. But the Obama administration, and again, I know people you know, think that, oh, yeah, yeah, he was so great. He was just so wonderful. Well, he tried to pull a fast one even on the Hawaiians. In fact, all of the meetings that they had, and they, and they had them all over, the, not only the, all over the islands, they actually had some on, on the continent too for some of these Hawaiian civic organizations that exist in places like Vegas and, 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 and different, different places where there's, there's pockets of, uh, of Hawaiian populations w- uh, living on the continent driven off economically from their, from their homelands. Um, even at those, the overwhelming majority of people were, were rejecting this so-called new rule. So the Obama administration kind of rejected those in-person, you know, uh, meetings, you know, public, you know, uh, hearings and said, oh, we got an overwhelming majority of, uh, of letters and emails suggesting that Hawaiian people you know, want to go for this, which was, which was uh, like a bald-faced lie. But as I sit here today as a, as a Native person, still trying to convince people that this Fed rec stuff is, is a debacle, it's only the Hawaiians do you, do you see a broader sense for the rejection of being designated a tribe, band, or nation of Indians subordinate to the laws of the United States. The rest of us just need to, need to still wake up. And, and the crazy part is the way they've twisted this thing into things like even land reclamation. I mean, the, the Mashpee are now faced with the, with the task of proving that they are not only submissive and and. and, and and have subject been subjugated by the United States, but that it happened in 1934. It is just this crazy situation that's been created. All right. Hey, we're at the bottom of the hour. So we're going to take a break and we come back on I want to go through this a little bit more because this kind of ties into the push to, to get us to run for offices and for voting in their elections and continue to enlist in their armed forces, all of that stuff. And we'll, we'll talk about that when we come back. This is John Kane. This is let's talk native. Be back in a minute. Thanks for coming back. Uh, look, before I get back into it, let me, uh, a couple of things. There, on Monday, 
is um, many people will celebrate Indigenous Peoples Day, uh, formerly known as and still celebrated by some as Columbus Day. So um, there are reasons for Native people to continue to make noise about Columbus Day. Uh, it's interesting that we are now uh, entering this this holiday weekend um, where many of those Columbus statues have been toppled in the, in the last year, actually not in the last year, just in the last six months as a result of some of the pushback on racial justice uh, tied to the murder of George Floyd and Bre Breonna Taylor and the, the push from the, the black lives matter movement. We became beneficiaries of some of that, um, awareness of racial injustice, and as a result of it, you know many of these many of these Columbus statues were actually toppled. They were they were vandalized. They were tor torn down. They were destroyed. Some of them that weren't necessarily destroyed were were taken down by city leaders. And you know Buffalo, New York, is a, is an example where where the, the statue in what is called Columbus Park uh, has been removed. Um, the uh, a statue in in Philadelphia it became a site of, uh, of really violence uh, it was you know people had gone there to protest and and a whole bunch of you know thugs with baseball bats and that kind of thing showed up to basically beat on the people who were protesting the Columbus statue and this you know this gets into the whole Italian American thing and that kind of stuff but we we right now are going to experience this this first Indigenous Peoples Day slash Columbus Day uh, to have occurred since some of this you know, racial reckoning has, uh, you know, ha has begun, at least in this this phase of it for, uh, you know, in uh, in the United States. So uh, it, it's an interesting time. Now, we are using that day uh, to to be a part of not just a gathering to acknowledge uh Indigenous Peoples Day, but to protest a major development that's happening in Avon, near Avon, New York, town of Rush, uh, an area in Seneca territory, where they're trying to build this mega solar farm facility um, on land that is, it's, it's not just disputed land, but it's, but it's burial grounds. It's, it's associated with the birthplace of, you know, of key Seneca figures in their, in their history and that kind of stuff. Um, it is still going through the approval process, but this attempt to, to gather, to acknowledge Indigenous Peoples Day and to demonstrate our pushback on doing one of these utility scale mega solar projects. Look, and it's not because Native people don't support you know, sustainable energy. We certainly do. But the idea of continuing to promote sustainable energy in the 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 huge multinational, you know, corporate structures of the United States it still an, it, it presents a, a, you know, a, a major problem to, to you know, any kind of green energy uh, push. So anyway, um, this is going to take place in uh, Avon, New York. Um, it's where routes, uh, U.S. routes five and twenty are together, right on the east side of the Genesee River. There's a parking lot it's near. I think the road's called Farmer Road. Um, and we're going to gather, and this is Monday, October 12th, Indigenous Peoples Day. Uh, at 11 a.m., we're going to gather. We're going to, we're going to walk to a historical marker uh, from there. Um, I think there's going to be some food and, you know, gather. Now, we are hearing all of a sudden that, uh, that there may be some pushback trying to limit us to 50 people. <laughs> because of the you know Western New York being designated a bit of a hot spot by the governor, we don't know how this is going to play out. So we may have to separate and do two groups of fifty. I don't know, depending on how many people show up. I guess um, I'm going to be there. Uh, I know the weather is not supposed to be great, but um, we're expecting the, there'll be. We should reach that fifty piece uh, persons mark anyway. Uh, but I, I do plan to be there. I know there are people coming from a variety of different places. Some friends have reached out to me that are coming from places that are you know not that close to here in fact um and we do expect some tuscaroras and some tonawana senecas and you know senecas from cataraugas and allegheny to be there so we'll, we'll see i don't know how much of a media event it's going to be but if nothing else it'll be a chance for us as native people to come together in a time that we haven't had much of this so um again that's that's monday october 12th at 11 a.m is when uh, a walk is is planned to start so you know Get there sometime before that. And it's um, on, on Route 5 and 20, 
Um, there's a parking lot uh, where Farmers Road, just again, just east of the the Genesee River. So, uh, look forward to to seeing folks there if you guys can make it. Uh, you know, come on out; it's a chance to say hello. Wear your mask and socially distance, by the way. All right. So, as I was saying about this um, federal recognition, there we become almost delusional. You know. You know I, I don't know, the Stockholm syndrome. It's like, oh yeah, we're yours. Yeah, and, and, and then we try to relish in this whole thing. I literally saw somebody say, well, I thought the only way uh, you lose your sovereignty is, is that the federal government doesn't recognize you. And uh, but again, you get into this, how, don't you, how, do, how is it that we just don't know what federal recognition is? You know, it, 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 and, it, and it's really problematic. I mean, look, and this ends up being, you know, gets tied to the census that is now coming to a close. You know, are we supposed to be counted? Do, do we need to be? Do we have an obligation to be counted as a population for U.S. and federal? Look, this, this idea of being counted in the census is, again, to determine where congressional seats are going to be. How, much, uh, how many congresspersons does a state get? You know, and where do they get designated? It's also associated with with federal dollars that go to states. You know, there's all of this implicated had nothing to do with us because we don't get dollars. I don't know. Somebody said, well, you have to understand with certain uh, federal programs, they do defer to census uh, census information. You know what? We represent such a small portion of people. You know, a friend of mine just posted on Facebook that, uh, you know, again, just according to census information, Native people represent 1.5 um, percent of the U.S. population. Um, yeah, that's a high figure. I have to understand if that comes from census information. That's from anybody who says, "Oh, yeah, my grandmother was a Cherokee princess." All that stuff, right? But in the overall scheme of things, even that 1.5 percent of the U.S. population, since that same source of information suggests that 70 percent of that population live off territory. That means that only less than 0.5%. I always say, well, you know, less than, you know, 1% uh, of the U.S. population. But it's, it's significantly less. Actually live on native territories. And yet we get all of this get out the native vote. Look, if you live in the city, if you live off territory, you're already inundated with the, you know, get out and vote. I mean, look, if you live on territory, you're, you're still inundated with it. I'm, I'm so happy that today is the deadline. Um, or yesterday is the deadline. The deadline for uh, registering in New York is is almost done. I can stop seeing these, you know, spam emails show up. All these Facebook posts. I can stop, you know, be getting barraged with that stuff. But the, the the get out the native vote is usually something that's concentrated on native people living on native territories, and that's the worst. Those that that is the worst case scenario. If you live on a native territory and you register to vote. And I've said this before, so I'm going, to, I'm going to reiterate it because hardly anybody else is saying what I'm about to say. If you live on native territory and you register to vote, you are literally signing a document that where you're suggesting the place that you live is within the state, whether it's New York here or whether you know it's in North Dakota or whatever, because states are the ones who control uh, state districts, I mean, voting districts and all that stuff. So you're not saying that your land is in the United States. You're saying you're within the state that surrounds you. And I'm not saying as, as a registrant, you know, for, for uh, you know, a voter registration that you have the authority to, con to subject your land to the states. But the fact of the matter is you are doing that. I mean, and you are making, signing a legal document that says where you live is a part of North Dakota or New York or whatever else. And that is a problem. And, you know, and, and from a Haudenosaunee standpoint, where we make the argument that our lands are not, that they're not part of New York State. They're not part of the United States. I know some people are troubled by, by this realization. Read the Canandaigua Treaty if, you, if, you, if you're into those kinds of documents. But... Many other territories, even with this whole Fed Rec stuff and this, uh, you know, uh, trust land applications, and you know, and, and let me be clear on this one too: most of the lands that the federal government claims is are, are trust lands are not lands that the United States 
granted to Native people. It's just how they started characterizing Native-held lands. They had to figure out, well, how do we solve this land title issue? Very few Native territories are held by Native people in original Native title, Seneca title, you know, here in Seneca territory. Very few Native territories have their lands held by them in their original, uh, on, under the original title. Very few. Most of it, and this goes for on the Canadian side too. The Canadian government, they oh yeah, we we hold the land in trust for uh, for Native people. There's always there's a big dispute, a debate, I guess, but a dispute on well, how is that land titled? I mean, because you know, look, we live in a, a society that that everything is about the documents, right? Everything's about, show me your deeds. That's that's a famous expression. And but somebody wants to borrow them, show me your deeds. <laughs> No, this is this is the 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 world that we we kind of live in. Now, I'm not saying we've got to subject ourselves to that, but it becomes a little hairy when we when we don't when we can't assert that we actually own our lands because the federal government says, "Oh no, we we changed that." What, what do you mean? We, what do you mean you changed that? Well, it's like changing their qualification for for recognition no you, you you're not you're not sovereign no you're you're subordinate to the laws of the united states we, we passed that law what do you mean you passed that law uh, no your lands aren't yours we, we hold them for you we we call it indian country but indian country as far as the federal government is concerned includes all of this trust land all of this land that the federal government holds that they hold the title they have the title to native lands but they hold it for our use and enjoyment our enjoyment and for our use, a use that they get to determine. This is an important issue, folks. We need to push back. We need to, to make a firmer acknowledgement that what they're claiming is their federal recognition is not how we recognize. We, we get to define ourselves. Now, I know a lot of people, especially when I reposted this, you know, this post from last year, a lot of people, you know, concurred and a lot of people agree. I had some people say, well, it's, you know, nobody has a right to condemn what people call themselves. You know, because in that post, I, you know, I think the, the actual um, meme that I uh, posted, I said, there should be nothing more demeaning than to call ourselves members of a federally recognized tribe. And, you know, I, I, got, I got some pushback. You know, native lawyer steps up and says, yeah, that, that's, that's wrong. You, nobody should be shamed for what they call themselves. Look, I know there's still territories and, and there's still people that, that can't move away from calling themselves Indians. We're not Indians. It's, it's a misnomer. It's, it's a mistake. I know there are people all over, you know, that still can't get away from calling ourselves tribes. Again, a derogatory word. And we have to move away from that. And, and over time, we do. Look, people don't accept the word Indian uh, in the way that they did, be in uh, the way Hollywood de defined it for us, for us, imposed upon us. So we are moving. I mean, Seneca Nation's dropping, they, SNI, that's what they're, Seneca Nation of Indians, they're dropping the, uh, the Indians part of this thing. In fact, they're actually moving more towards calling themselves Onondawaga, which is their, their real names, right? This is, this is a trend. This is the movement that we have to advance forward. Words matter. You know, be accepting these imposed labels and, and, and names like Indians, like tribes, like reservations. These all have political connotation to them. I mean, Indians are, are defined by the federal government. We don't define ourselves as that. And even the, the names that they call us as, as people, so to speak, they, they separate. The Oneida Indian Nation of New York, the Oneida Tribe of Wisconsin, the Thames Band of Oneidas. That's just one example. But Seneca Nation of Indians, the, you know, the Tonawana Band of, of, of Senecas. Look, we can reject those names anytime we want. They may still have it on their books, but that's not, we don't have to accept their definitions. The St. Regis tribe of Mohawks. I mean, the, uh, uh, then, or you get, uh, get into, into other strange words like Lac de Flambeau, you know, a Corps de Lane, you know, uh, um, Colville Reservation. I mean, look, some of these names have nothing to do with us. They separate us. You know, um, and, and, and we, they include words like Sioux 
Not our word. Navajo, not our word. I mean, not, not the word. It's, it's not, Den, it's Dene, it's Lakota. You know, we, we can assert our own, our own names. And look, if, if I'm coming across as shaming somebody for calling themselves a tribe, a band, you know, uh, you know or, or Indians, I, look, I'm not trying to shame anybody. I'm trying to, you know, maybe wake people up a little bit and say, we don't have to be bound by the words that they, they, they cast upon us. We don't have to be bound by their definition of a federally recognized tribe. Look, are they going to pull their, you know, whatever, you know, comes with this so-called federal recognition? Regardless, I, I, there's nothing wrong with rejecting U.S. citizenship or, or pushing back on U.S. jurisdiction uh, and, and authority. There, in fact, that's who we are. I mean, I, somebody literally tried to say, say to me in, in one conversation that our ancestors fought for the right to be U.S. citizens. When? When did that happen? <laughs> at, at, at Wounded Knee? Even those people who enlisted in the armed forces did so perhaps out of some level of acceptance, but more out of responding to their current circumstance as living as oppressed people. But to suggest that our people fought, you know, fought war that died and bled for the right to vote. Where? When? When did that happen? Because I don't know. My people didn't do that. I mean, and I don't know anybody. I, I don't know of any example where somebody can say, yes, our people fought in the streets for the right to vote in U.S. elections. I know that there's pushback now. Hell, in North Dakota. When the governor tried to make it more difficult for native people to vote, they, oh, see that our vote's so important. They're trying to you know suppress our vote. Our vote's not important. There's no place and I've said it before. There's no place that the native vote will turn a red state blue, or a blue state red. I mean, it just doesn't exist. We represent again on our territories. If you would have took the took the total number of our people living on territories, less than five percent of the of the U.S. population. I mean, I mean. I mean, no, I'm sorry, less than 0.5 of the U.S. population. We're, we're far less than, than 1% of the U.S. population. We aren't, we aren't a significant number. Now, can a certain region you know, put somebody into a state legislature if they wanted to? Sure, sure, that's been done. And if we run in their national elections for you know, Congress or, or Senate or, or President, there's no way that we get there without white people having to carry us there. White people have to carry that. I mean, so whether you're Deborah Halland or Sharice David, white people had to elect you. I'm not saying native people didn't vote, but if you took away that native vote, you probably still would have got elected anyway, because you had enough white people supporting you. I mean, this, this whole idea of federal recognition and subjugation, we have almost embraced it. No, not almost. In many territories, it has been embraced. Look, you can go to a lot of native territories, even on the Canadian side. You can see Canadian flags flying all over native native lawns and porches. U.S. flags all over all over native you know, lawns and, and and porches. We have been indoctrinated. What they did was wrong. And 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 let me get back to my to my Hawaiian story. For generations, Hawaiians accepted that they had somehow submitted to an annexation process. And this current generation of Hawaiians became painfully aware of the truth. They, they learned of the, of the, they had to almost relearn the, the existence of, of the Kuwait petition. I'm not saying nobody knew it, but there were many, there were generations of Hawaiians that kind of just never talked about it. They, they just kind of accepted the fate. You know, it, it is fate, I guess. But this generation said, no, our people came out in numbers. Our people signed petitions and they, they, they rejected this idea of annexation. And so this generation of Hawaiians is actually taking a position that previous generations of Hawaiians wouldn't take. Now, I'm not condemning those previous generations, but today we have more knowledge. We have more information at our fingertips than we've ever had. We have truth. We don't have to accept what somebody else says we are the Hollywood version of being, uh, you know, of being native. We don't, we don't have to accept it. We, we, can re we can reject that right out of hand. We get to determine what our identities are. 
And I know because of what we've experienced historically, there is no question. There is no question that um, we have been, you know, we we've had our identities, you know, thrown into a state of flux. We are suffering from an, an identity crisis, and there's no question about that. So we really we need to to do our. Uh, we gather our own information. We need to assess who we are ourselves. This is something that we as individuals get to do. Frankly, not even the so-called native governments get to define who we are as individuals. They, let's remember that whether it's an elected government, whether it's traditional government, those people who are put into those positions are servants of the people, not lords and masters. So, we as people need to really um, assert our our power, the, the 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 power that we have simply as a birthright. We are creation gave us the power to carry ourselves. It didn't come from God. It didn't come from government. It didn't come from some law that got passed. Look, even in the United States, what they call the Bill of Rights are not rights that the federal government gives to people. It is, it, what it, the Bill of Rights in the U.S. Constitution, what it's supposed to be, is a list of rights that the United States acknowledges exists and promises not to infringe upon. They don't, they don't claim to be granting these rights. Free speech isn't, isn't a right of, that is given to people in, in, uh, in the U.S. Constitution. And, and so when I hear even native persons, well, my ancestors fought in the uh, U.S. military for your right to, to speak freely. I'm sorry, that's, that's just wrong. That's not true. It's simply not true. The right to be able to speak freely, the, the right to, you know, to believe what you want to believe, uh, you know, even from a religion standpoint, that's not a right that the United States gave our people, or even gave their people, even the, even the right to to bear arms, that the whole Second Amendment thing. What it says is that right that right exists, and the United States shall not infringe. Yeah, it kind of says that. <laughs> it doesn't exactly say that, but it kind of says that. So I think this idea that that people think that that our rights are granted to us from people more powerful than us, no. That's, that's not the way it exists. So I wanted to revisit this idea of what federal recognition is. I want to, and because it gets back to, you know, a, look, a theme that I talk about all the time, our identity, who we are, who we are, who we were, who we are, and who we, uh, who we see ourselves as. Look, I know some people want to defend the right to call them. You know, they want to defend, you know, their right to call themselves Indians, tribes, you know, Americans, but as time goes on, that push back to assert our sovereignty, our distinction, becomes a more audible drumbeat. We are hearing more and more of that. And that's how we assert land rights. That's how we protect lands, like, like even in Avon, New York, how we, how we shut down pipelines, how, how we stand up. It is based on our identity that we define not defined by others. When we talk about grassroots, you know, I, you know, I'm not even crazy about that uh, description because, you know, it, it suggests that we don't have power unless there's enough of us. No, we are born. Every individual is born with a certain amount of authority. So whether we coalesce together, whether, we, whether we, we, you know, stand together as blades of grass, you know, to, to support the weight that's, that's up upon us, yeah, I, I, or whether we do it in mass or whether we do it as individuals, all of us have a responsibility to to promote um, how we see ourselves going forward. All right, hey, I, I do, want, do want to remind people, if you are not subscribed to our podcast uh, and to our YouTube channel, which is Let's Talk Native TV, you may be missing content. So um, by all means, surprise, uh, subscribe to our podcast, subscribe to our YouTube channel. Um, I want to... Um, uh, mentioned that that I have a great Columbus video that Jake and I worked on called Columbus in His Own Words. It is a it is it's timely. This is probably the time of year people should revisit this one. Uh, it is a good time to recap 
why those t statues need to be toppled, why they need to be removed, why we need to speak out against Columbus. Um, I think, I think it's really important. So check out, uh, on our YouTube channel, let's talk native TV, Columbus in his own words. Look, uh, we are also on Patreon and we are working to create, um, specific and exclusive content to our Patreon members. So go to patreon.com slash let's talk native, uh, so sign up, support this program, support what we're doing here. The more resources we have, the more that we can do. And we're, we're in a constant state of trying to build out the ability to have these conversations. So support us. Uh, you can support us on, pay, on PayPal. You can, you know, there's any number of ways, but Patreon is, is, I'm kind of excited about what Patreon represents. Uh, I haven't, we didn't pull that, that trigger yet uh, for many, for a while, but now we have. So you can find us on Patreon, uh, subscribe. There, you know, there's multiple levels. You can, you can get involved with us on, uh, to support the program. And we will be um, producing exclusive content for our Patreon members. So, um, again, look for us on our, our podcast, ask Alexa, search, let's talk native with John Kane podcast, and you'll find us there. Um, so I'm gonna thank you for listening. Uh, hopefully some of you can come out. Don't worry about the 50 person thing, <laughs> but hopefully some of you can come out on, on Monday to stand with us for indigenous people's day and to stand up against uh, development on uh, disputed Seneca territory. I look forward to that. Thanks for listening. This is John Kane. This is let's talk native. Yahweh.